Check, check. Yeah. Check. Hello. Uh, should we start? Yes. Four. I have to four. Hello again. So this is a panel about uh, machine learning, or maybe about AI. It's not very clear. Um, and so we have uh, we are four here. I will not introduce myself because I talked a lot already this morning. But we have uh, Spencer Salazar on the far right from right. Output. Vamshi Ragu here from uh, uh, from Knowles. Knowles, how do you spell it? Yeah, that's correct. Knowles or Knowles? Knowles. Knowles. Yeah. And Russell McClellan from Isotope. And um, we didn't prepare anything fancy with demos and uh, stuff. So what we'll do is do a short introduction for each. Then there are some questions that I will ask uh, our panelists. But we'd like this to be very open to uh, people here having questions about AI. If possible, uh, provocative questions, questions for which we would not agree all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So I don't know. You can start maybe saying who you are, what you do. Yes, yeah, so I'm Vamshi. I work for Knowles, which is a company that makes components for consumer audio. And uh, off late, it's like a lot of our components are targeting audio subsystems for AI and ML on the edge, because it seems like this is a great place to put uh, certain kinds of intelligence. So the classic use cases being hot word recognition and uh, audio front-end processing and audio uh, post-processing, all of which involves some amount of machine learning. So we're sort of the gateway to machine learning on the cloud. On a personal level, for me, the connect with AI and ML actually started with uh, music software. And I was interested in using the human voice as a musical sound controller in the late 90s when it seemed like this was a very bad time to solve this problem. But I tumbled down some of the same paths that were not, at that point, uh, very tractable problems. So it, it seems like it's a, it's a very ripe time to uh, solve many of those problems, and maybe I've been patiently waiting. Uh, but as of now, my role in Knowles is uh, leading the uh, developer and integrator experience, where I get to interact with a lot of algorithm developers who are working on advanced audio algorithms that they want to run on resource-constrained devices. So that's, that's all about me. Thanks. Cool. Hi, I'm Russell. Uh, I work at Isotope. Isotope's uh, a company that does innovative products that are supposed to inspire people to be creative. So most of our customers are either musicians, so from the bedroom level all up to the pros, and then also people who work in film audio. Um, so personally, I'm a software engineer, so I'm not an ML researcher or an ML practitioner in any way. I've sort of been an audio programming developer my whole career. So uh, at Isotope, um, you know, after I started, we worked kind of trying to get ML into a lot of products that ended up in people's hands as actual kind of practical tools. So that's sort of my interest is how do we take all of this research and kind of like you know, craft it into things that are actually usable to people. So um, I've worked on teams that uh, released Neutron, which was the first Isotope product with deep learning in it. Um, then I've worked on kind of the RX series, which has a lot of the really advanced source separation. If you caught my talk yesterday, I talked about some of that. And then most recently, we released a product called Dialog Match that's using uh, ML to sort of like turn the knobs on a reverb to sort of match um, production audio for film to studio audio. So I uh, have some experience with kind of taking these kind of abstract ideas and putting them into concrete products. Uh, yeah. Cool. Uh, my name is Spencer Salazar. I'm the CTO of Output. Um, if you're not familiar with our company and our software, we make different types of synthesizers and um, content um, for musicians and composers and such. Our flagship product is Arcade, which is sort of a network connected uh, loop synthesizer that's constantly sort of providing new content for people. Um, for the past year and a half or so, we've been doing research into like new ways of incorporating machine learning research into products that our customers use in ways that are kind of like empower them and really um, sort of enables new forms of creativity for, for our customers. Um, and then aside from that, um, in my PhD research, I also did, um, I worked in musical human computer interaction in ways that uh, incorporated certain parts of machine learning for things like gesture recognition, for instance. So that's pretty much me. Thanks. So I guess uh, first question could, would, could be uh, in order to um, 
to depart from this uh, mythology of AI and machine learning? Like, is there, like, can you tell us uh, concretely uh, how AI, machine learning, or maybe even big, da big data, which is, you know, all this is now like a, almost a single uh, abstract uh, entity. Uh, how did it change the way you think, you work, you address, or you solve the problem that you deal with like, uh, every day? Like, uh, what did it, how did it impact uh, the most so far, your work? If there is not no answer, I'll keep it. <laughs> yeah. Which is about Brexit, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I can start. So as a software developer, it's sort of a really big shift to go into kind of a machine learning mindset because you're used to being in control of everything and you're used to writing all the algorithms in yourself. Um, but uh, with ML, there's sort of a lack of control where you, it's really all about the data. So you need to you know, create a large data set, feed it into the machine, the machine will output a model. Uh, you, you kind of will never understand the model in the same way that you understand your own code. So for things like you know, debugging or just uh, you know, figuring out what went wrong, what stage of the process went wrong, it can be a lot more opaque than sort of any sort of DSP algorithm you wrote yourself. And also I touched on this a little bit at my talk yesterday, but as far as quality assurance, it's a very different mindset where you're, you're thinking more subjectively rather than objectively. Um, yeah. But uh, so, because many people talk about, indeed, about uh, explainability and, uh, you know, AI or being at a black box and uh, mm -hmm. in many cases, uh, it's, uh, it's something that actually prevents uh, industrializ industrialization of AI. I know this is true for critical systems, for instance, where they still, they can't really uh, ship things because they don't really know, they don't have any, any guarantees. So in your space, in your business, in your activities, uh, how do you cope with that, with that, you know, the fact that you have to ship something and in fact you don't really give any guarantee or some, sort, or, or some sort? Yeah, I mean, this was sort of a mind shift change for me. In, in traditional CS, you're always looking at the worst case uh, performance or the worst case error. Uh, you sort of have to give that up with machine learning. There's these things called adversarial examples that are these specially tuned things that will make the AI do totally the wrong thing. And um, so you can't really think about that, what's the worst case mindset? You sort of have to shift your bar a little bit and think about, well, it's gonna work most of the time for most people. And often when you're developing products, you, you have to kind of put in um, ways for the user to correct things when they do go wrong. You can't, um, I, I don't think it's a good idea to just ship a product that doesn't allow any control after the fact, because you know, as you say, nothing's gonna be perfect. Yeah, in our case, um, speaking to the original question of how it sort of changed things, like in, in one way, it, it hasn't changed all that much, especially with regards to things like uh, music information retrieval, like machine learning based techniques compared to more, you know, vintage MIR, like pretty much provides like a complete step up for things like categorization, um, source separation as well, things like that. Like it's just sort of been this just sort of step up in terms of what we're able to do with, with tools with tools today. Um, but I do think there's also a little bit of reframing and how like problems are, are solved. For, for instance, like taking research and being able to deploy it um, takes kind of new ways of thinking, like for models that could take a very long time to train, um, how do you deploy that in a way that it can finally be used by someone on like a very small computer, you know, a relatively small computer. Um, so we've had, a, we've had a lot of challenges um, with those types of problems of like taking the research, all of the really like um, interesting research that's out there and sort of turning it into something that can actually be deployed. Yeah, yeah with consumer audio, I think one of the things that comes up that's a sensitive uh, topic is privacy. And that's been something that's been very close to what we've been working on at Knowles is uh, how, can we, how can we leverage the fact that you can run AI in different places and if you can run some of your code in a device that's closer to you, then maybe you, know, you can get away with uh, some of the sensitivity issues that come up with you know, sending it to the cloud. Yeah, t talking about uh, things that have changed, I think we all have, it's, we all have a viewpoint which is more business uh, oriented, but as I, as I said this morning, I was very personally very uh, impressed by the fact that many researchers and uh, really the smartest ones, maybe like mathematics and signal processing, working on source separation, have actually to find another subject, and that's uh, that's to me. Uh, I mean, from the research, more like the research viewpoint, that's uh, 
that's a very strong impact. So we have like armies of researchers which are, who are very good in what they do. And they, basically, the, their problems have disappeared. And uh, <clears throat> so one of the questions is how do, can we use this expertise still and, uh, and make, it, make, uh, make it fit to the, the way that the research agenda is changing? So there, another question is like uh, for you is maybe related, but uh, what are, for, for, from your viewpoint, interesting or striking examples of uh, how AI or machine learning has changed, the, let's say, the, the technology of music, the space of technology and music so far? I mean, what is the thing that uh, impresses you the most? Well, there's a lot of changes uh, from my perspective. So, I mean, one big one is how we develop kind of denoising algorithms. And Isotopes shipped many denoising algorithms that use deep learning, but other companies have as well. And that's something where a lot of these things are very hard to tease apart because they, you know, for example, if it's a voice denoiser, a lot of things look a lot like voices. So I talked yesterday about microphone rustle, and it's something that sort of occurs at the same kind of time frequency and the same uh, frequency as voice. Um, you know, a lot of other examples of like dogs barking, things like this. These are very hard to kind of fine tune algorithms for. So it's something where if you have enough data, you really can just kind of throw it at the machine and get something usable out. So yeah, um, thinking about uh, like, you know, how do we, <laughs> so we certainly have had examples where we've had, um, you know, we've tried to do certain types of denoisers before deep learning and just couldn't do it. And then um, you know, we thought about those. We knew that there was the use case there. So when we had this new tool available, we tried it out on that, and some of those worked. So yeah, that kind of does make you feel bad about like, OK, I have a DSP background. But, you know, what am I good for anymore? I think there's, there are ways to hybridize them, though. Like There are, are ways like you, know, you can use the machine learning to tune uh, parameters in traditional DSP that has a nice sound that you already liked. Or you could put um, kind of more sophisticated models in the network and put some of your DSP knowledge that way. Although I do have the question if that's just a short-term thing. Like eventually maybe the, um, you know, the most simple models that are going to be trained for the longest actually might perform the best. Because some of the stuff that we th we're putting in that we think might be helpful and we think might be knowledge that we're putting in might just be arbitrary constraints that, that you know, hurts the machine in the end. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose it's not like the, the biggest contribution in terms of like intellectual achievement, but as far as like the democratization of these tools and making them available to people who maybe don't have a PhD in like CS or something like that, um, and making it more available to artists or independent developers or smaller boutique sort of software shops, I think has been incredible to see. For instance, um, it's not really an audio software it's not really related to audio machine learning so much. They don't have any audio models to my knowledge, but there's a program called Runway, um, which basically you just download it and you can connect to like all sorts of different models that are available in open source and like plug your own uh, video content or imagery into it. And it's sort of designed more towards artistic professionals, creative professionals who want to use these tools um, to explore new ways of using these techniques. Um, these are sort of well-known, uh, famously released a library called Splitter, I think, a week or two ago, which is basically a, a neural network-based source separation uh, model and code to, to run the model, which uh, it's completely open source. You can go download and use it right now. And personally, I'm excited to see like what um, you know someone in their bedroom, like a developer in their bedroom, is going to figure out like how to do like a, what how to use that software in interesting and creative ways that. Um, that's like larger companies may not really have attention for. So um, things like that, I think, are really exciting to see. Yeah, I think another exciting thing for musicians is that uh, this goes back to what you were saying about researchers having to find something other than source separation. <laughs> I think it's very interesting today that you can uh, take a song and then you can get sort of somewhat low quality separation version of all of the samples. And then if you have a sample library, uh, that is very comprehensive, then you can go from those low quality samples to something in your library that's the closest match and have a full recreation of the song. So it sort of suddenly makes a lot of music become more open source than it used to be, because it seems like you can just take a song from you. To, I know this is not absolutely possible today, but it looks like it's very much around the corner where like maybe like a year down the line, I don't know, I'm just being very speculative about this. We could have a tool that you, you can pick an arbitrary song on YouTube and you have all of the samples that you need for it. 
And so maybe it sort of uh, op may may maybe makes sort of AI enabling people to uh, get to the source of more of the music that used to be very opaque. So continuing in the tradition of sort of sampling, you know, it, may, may, it really democratizes a lot of the content that was locked up and uh, maybe not accessible to everyone. Yeah, so it's a bit of a paradox because the more AI is progressing and is progressing really every day. I mean, uh, there are papers every day, uh, Google alerts of things. Uh, but it's mostly open source, so how do you see AI, like is, you see it as a, in some sense could be a competition, a uh, non-fair competition, because if you are a company, it's, it's hard to fight against that, or is it a commodity, and how do you see, how can you differentiate yourself from your competition, whatever it is, I mean, uh, how do you see the, 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 the use of AI in, in the context of a competitive market, right, where everything is open source? Well, it's an interesting question. I mean, I've, I've, I, I won't name the company, but I've had conversations with sort of big players in the AI industry who are more, more or less state up front that, you know, music software is a rounding error on their yearly business ledger. And so, like, when companies don't really even care about music software, or at least it's like, it's, it's not necessarily that important to like what their overall mission is as a company. There's plenty of spaces to fill in that are really interesting and also still lucrative for, for smaller shops or, or depending on who the developer is. Um, and the other aspect of it is it's, it's certainly one thing to release a model or an algorithm as open source, but I think it's, um, it's a much harder problem to take that and turn it into a product and um, you know, to, to design it correctly so that people can actually use it and, and take something that's a Jupyter notebook that you know, does really amazing things, but put that into like a small plugin that opens up um, instantly and doesn't require any setup or fiddling with weights or numbers or anything like that. Yeah, I, I talked about a similar issue at my talk, sort of there's, even if you have a fully trained model, getting it into a product that's actually usable is you know, totally non-trivial. So I think that's where, you know, Isotope, that's one of the places where we excel. But you know, speaking to the larger question, there's so much energy going into uh, deep learning. Like it's almost like every audio conference now has many deep learning papers. There's many deep learning specific conferences. Keeping up with all that would be a full-time job. But then under that, there's this democratization aspect because so many of these models are open source, you have just people in their bedroom trying out random stuff. That's another whole layer that you'd have to keep track of. So that can be kind of overwhelming. I think the good news is in the kind of product space, I think a lot of the things that are well understood still are under productized, like even things like audio classification, something that you know on Apple platforms, you can use the create ML tool, it's a drag and drop tool to make it. And yet you don't see it so much in the industry. So I think probably the part of that is it speaks to how hard it is to actually productize this stuff. But then, you know, also I think, you know, that's the ray of sunlight is that, you know, even if we stick to things that really don't require any research, there's a lot to do that hasn't been done. Yeah, I think what's uh, interesting is that uh, the way in which the ecosystem incentivizes people to uh, open source things is that if you don't take a long term view on many of the things that you're keeping closed source, eventually it's going to become commoditized and then you're not going to be able to get the win that you wanted. So it may be better to sort of work higher up in the design hierarchy and look at the use cases. And in some cases, treat the AI or ML uh, as infrastructure and focus more on the value add that you can add on top of that. And at that point, it sort of goes back to very traditional design problem where you treat AI just like any other component in your design. So it, yeah, there, there could be core R&D that you, know, you wanna keep proprietary, but it's uh, important to take the right stance in terms of how long-term you look and open source the things that are going to get commoditized anyway. Yeah, the other comment I had on that is, so the models and the kind of training algorithms is just one piece of the puzzle. The part that is rarely open source is the data, which is often you know, even more critical to the success than you know, the specific models that you're using. So in a way, like, it's, kind of, it's not fair to say that you know, most things that come out are open source, because often the data is closed or it's locked down under a very certain license. So that's just one thing to think about. Like, you know, I remember, uh, yeah, I guess, won't name names, but there's been many times where there's been amazing results that uh, you can't replicate without their amazing data that they're you know, keeping under wraps. And uh, so speaking of progress, I mean, for you, what are the, uh, the, uh, the problems that are still not solved? 
uh, by AI or by uh, whatever, like the big thing that you would dream. I w when I was, uh, when I bought my first uh, DX7 uh, in a few centuries ago, <laughs> uh, I thought it would be great to have a system that, uh, you know, can find a patch uh, automatically based on a sound or whatever. And actually, it still does not really exist, you know. Uh, so, so, but I don't think it's a big problem for humanity to solve. But I mean, from you, from, from obviously AI is not solving everything. So for you, what, are, what is the next big thing that you would like AI or uh, to solve that would really change your? Yeah, I think uh, one thing that's. Uh, sorry, is your, is your mic on? I can't. Sorry, no, no. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, you're good. Okay. I don't know if it's from the microphone or if it's just me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Please. Yeah, I, I We're going to give you more than that, so I'm just about to get a hand out and bring it to you. Thank you. Someone else wants to? Mm. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Are you able to hear me now? Yeah, I think something that I find that is uh, hard to solve with AI, maybe you covered a little bit of that uh, this morning, is this problem of uh, what is it that is worth paying uh, attention to? And uh, maybe this is interesting both from the perspective of someone who's consuming the song, but also in the creation process itself, getting feedback on where you're making repetitive patterns and sort of organizing all of the different types that you're making. So if you were to take each sample that you create as falling into a type, having uh, the AI sort of automatically classify it into a bunch of buckets, this is something that I find that uh, I don't have easy access to these tools, but maybe Russell and... Uh, Spencer can comment. You, you don't need this mic. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, as far as, you know, the, you know, playing around with your DX7 and, and finding the sound that matches the thing that you're trying to recreate, the pieces are actually all there as, as far as I can see. You know, we were able to basically, you know, source separation is now a solved problem, we're declaring. Um, and it's, it's, it's not hard to go from there to doing basically a lookup against all the possibilities of sounds that you can create with whichever instrument that you're working with. Um, it's really not a stretch, it's just a matter of you know, figuring out the details, I think. Um, and I think to me at least, that speaks to sort of the larger issue of there are so many solved problems out there in the research that have yet to be connected to products. And like, to me, that's, that's what's exciting is to, take this, this huge world that the research community has, has created and start to think about how these um, tools can be put in the hands of creators. I think um, it was really interesting to, to see your talk this morning, Francois, because I think things like style transfer are, are actually uh, problems that are worth looking into more and thinking about how you might um, use those types of techniques that are really common in, in nowadays in visual sort of oriented machine learning and seeing how that might work um, in the musical domain. And then I think that there's also sort of different types of MIR that are still sort of open issues. Um, for us at least, like I, I, we haven't seen very great like key and BPM analysis, um, things like that, just sort of figuring out the different properties of sounds um, in much more nuanced ways. Um, I think there's a lot of improvement um, to be had there that c machine learning could lead us to. Yeah, speaking about the DX7 patch issue specifically. Sorry, I, I didn't want no, to. No, 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 no. <laughs> there was, there was a uh, project with, it was a collaboration with Aphex Twin, and I forget who's the main guy who did it, that was not a neural network or anything, but it was a like evolutionary model, and it sounded so weird and horrific, and it didn't work at all, but it was amazing. So that, that's worth checking out. So. <laughs> um, yeah, as far as like unsolved problems, I think, yeah, for me, it mostly falls into the stuff you were talking about this morning with just like art and things where there's not necessarily a, um, like an objective measure or, or kind of thinking further than that, like sort of emotional response. Like, wouldn't it be cool if it could detect when I hated what it was playing and it would do something different? So things like that where kind of breaking out of the like strict input output mode is, you know, those are my personal dreams. Like, that's what I would love to see is something that wasn't so constrained to this kind of linear input output thinking. Yeah. Yeah, something that I sort of started using pretty often nowadays is uh, even on sort of just a draft track, sending it over to Lander. And I was very pleasantly surprised with the results that you get from a master from Lander. But I see that I, I can't get the same thing for the mixing process. 
And I, I know it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a much more subjective thing. Probably both of them are subjective, but it seems like there's a lot that you could get if you could just constantly sound good. Because uh, I feel like the thing that I miss the most from being a musician playing traditional instruments in a band to going into electronic music is this paradox of choice. And, and, and the biggest problem is actually just sounding good all the time. Because it seems like all my attention goes towards trying to get things to gel together and sound good as opposed to actually making music. And it seems to always get in the way because I'm always trying to think like an engineer. So I feel like that's something that, that's a big missing spot is if we could find maybe even an opinionated way of mixing for certain styles that constrains you in such a way that you can constantly sound good. I feel like that would be like a really nice problem to focus on. Maybe someone's looking at it. Maybe you're looking at it. I don't know. No, but but I, I think that's precisely a, a very problematic. So f to come back at the style transfer, what I, I find fascinating is that each time you solve a big problem, you actually create new ones, <laughs> which are even, in, even more complicated. For, for instance, style transfer, is, if you suppose it, it works, uh, you could, uh, you could um, uh, how to say, create something new from picking up two existing things, sounds, songs, whatever. So, so the number of possibilities is huge. And actually, you can style transfer with two or three or four. So you have the number of songs, 50 millions, by, at the power of two or three. And obviously, this, cannot, this tool cannot be used without any kind of recommendation system or something that will tell you what is good and what is not good exactly. And so we fall always on that problem. And I don't think this problem uh, can be solved. And, you, and when you say it should sound good, you know, what does it mean today? It doesn't mean the same as 30 years ago. And the new ways of making sound, I, I, it's a bit provocative, but I mean, machine learning, by definition, will not invent that new way because it will only replicate whatever it has been uh, trained with, which is necessary from the past. So don't you think that there is a kind of um, a complicated trade-off between, uh, you know, using ML to replicate stuff, you know, sounding good or not sounding good, but sounding as uh, X or Y, and you know, g building a, tr a tool for creativity, which in principle should be should be supposed to do exactly the opposite, that is, letting people do new things. Yeah, I think it's a central dilemma of using machine learning is that in principle it could just do everything. So, uh, what is what is it that what is it that you need to do? And if, I mean, without getting too deep into that rabbit hole, because I think maybe that's a very deep philosophical question, is that, is, is it possible to reformulate this, instead of being an existential question to being a simple design question, is it possible for AI to assist human beings in, a, in an opinionated way and maybe with the trade-off that it constrains your creativity and maybe it's constraining your creativity in a direction that's, uh, it has some bias that we have built into the AI and uh, if you're willing to do the homework, then you can go deeper in, and that means that you have to become more intelligent in the way that you interact with this AI or ML algorithm. So if, if you're not going to be able to become uh, comfortable with interacting with an AI, and, and, and this might not just be programming, because it seems like we're going to, we're going to become smarter and smarter in the ways that we empower end users to interact with AI. So, Maybe it's sort of, you know, going back to this idea of reformulating it as a design problem at the top level of the user interaction. Maybe there's a very easy and constrained way to interact with the AI, but you're really giving up most of the control to the way the AI is biased to think. But then if you're willing to invest in learning how the AI works, then the sky's the limit. You can completely reprogram it. And uh, I think maybe somebody put this really well. Uh, I don't recall the exact blog article, but it said uh, the AI problem can be reformulated as the Iron Man versus Ultron problem. So are, are you using AI to augment your abilities and then you're willing to invest a lot in understanding how the AI works? Or are you sort of just merging in with the AI and maybe as it gets smarter and smarter, it's going to get harder and harder to see where to draw the line. Well, what's been interesting as far as um, you know, AI and machine learning potentially enforcing like a status quo and not allowing new forms of art to emerge is, in fact, at least in the visual domain, we've we've seen actually very new forms of art. Like, um, I think like some of the stuff coming out of all of the various generative adversarial networks like seems to be 
very much its own entirely new genre of, of art as well as things like Deep Dream, which honestly kind of creeps me out. But, um, you know, these are new ways of, of visual representation that didn't really exist before. And I, I don't know if we've seen that in music so much. It seems like it's mostly been an exercise in sort of um, replicating existing things. But again, when you, when you turn over these tools to artists and make them easier to use for people who might have some kind of zany idea, like you're going to get a little bit more of people repurposing them for things that potentially they weren't meant to do. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. I mean, so many of the tools we've created, you know, don't kind of, they're not start to finish music creation tools. They're tools that are meant to remove roadblocks along the way. And maybe the hope is, yeah, by kind of making this step faster, you're going to be able to go farther away because you know it's like you know riding a bike or something. So I think that's another you know really valid use of ML is just sort of take away those sort of really tedious parts like creating a DX7 patch or you know setting your EQ just right or setting your reverb just right. You know doing things like that, you can still be driven by the intent of the user, and that can be kind of an input into the ML. So I don't think it does necessarily remove any agency from the artist, or at least it doesn't have to. No. Yeah, I, I mean, I have one last remark to make in this is that, so AI, at least the old school or the classical AI, uh, if I get this correctly, originated in control and planning problems. And we see a lot of new AI also being formulated as some sort of a goal-directed problem. And I think if we were to expand the system inside of which this goal um, is defined, because art, it seems like, is somewhat defying this sort of a very goal-directed formulation of uh, what the AI needs to solve. But if we were to reformulate the uh, artistic problem more in terms of a control problem, it becomes somewhat twisted because it means that if we can get people to pay attention, and it seems like that's what we're doing with mobile devices today, is that you can sort of bias people into pay paying attention to certain kinds of things. And if an AI starts to become very good at this, then it's very possible that our definition of art can become, uh, it can reach a local maximum in some sense. And we, are, we, are, we have figured out a way to program ourselves to pay attention to something that we don't really want to. So I, I think it's really up to us to um, rise up to pushing AI and to push ourselves to this undefined existential end. So, you know, I, I was avoiding that uh, philosophical rabbit hole, but I think made it's it. begging to be asked. You did it. So maybe it's time if, if people have questions uh, to take the mic. Uh, otherwise, we are going to continue saying very general stuff. So is, is, <laughs> is has anyone any question that we could uh, try uh, to answer? I think there is a mic there. Uh, no? I mean, about among the, t the themes, yeah, yes, sorry, yes, I don't see. Um, so uh, I had a question that, um, so regarding research going on into AI and music, uh, it is something that is very heavily data driven. And when it comes to research in uh, universities versus research in industries, academic research is usually severely restricted by the fact that they don't have as insane data sets as industries have. So from your pers perspective as people from the industry, what do you think are the kind of fields or subfields that uh, research in universities should be focused towards for AI and music? So, so I can say something because I, I come from there somehow. I'm still uh, somehow a researcher. But uh, yes, I think you're completely right. But that's not new. Um, uh, that's all, it has been like this for a number of domains. I remember when uh, a domain called constraint programming, you know, emerged in the 90s. Uh, people started to solve simple problems like the N queen problem or toy problems, which were actually quite complicated. And then the industry started to be interested, and then they started to be to solve real large-scale problems like optimizing the port of Singapore, that kind of stuff. And then all the problems vanished from the universities. And the domain uh, kind of died, and, 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 and people had to focus on the more theoretical stuff, or trying to do completely different things, or taking the problems in different ways. And I, I think that you're right. I mean, lots of the data is not uh, going to be available, not so much, yeah, because it's industry and also because of the 
legal system around. It's not so much the industry that is because a lot of this data is sensitive or it's protected or you know people don't want to give it away, that kind of st stuff. So I, it is me, there are some data, data set available, like the one million song data set, but still, I mean, it's difficult to find good data. So my, my opinion is that universities should focus on much more basic stuff in the sense of basic research trying really to find new ways of looking at these problems, trying to, to seriously uh, do research on what, on attention, you know, what does it mean for someone to like a piece of music, for instance, like the, the state of knowledge is exactly zero today. We don't have any idea why people like a piece of music or not. Um, and I'm sure that there will be a, would be a lot of uh, interesting technical developments if people started to do that. But uh, to me, the only solution, if we want the universities to continue existing, is, is that they, they, they start to look at uh, completely different problems. That's my view, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in my case, um, I didn't have access to particularly insane resources in academia. Um, but. Um, basically, I was, I was mostly using existing techniques to sort of think about how they might be useful for musical tools. Um, specifically, um, my, my academic research focused on using handwriting analysis and recognition for basically like musical, like creating different types of musical systems. And um, if you've paid any attention to machine learning literature over the past you know, several decades, handwriting recognition and character recognition is kind of like the oldest problem in the book. At least it's one of the benchmarks that's used for, or it has been used for lots of uh, um, many, many, many uh, techniques over the years. And so in my case, it was actually very easy to just take something that had existed for, for quite a long time and to be able to rethink and reshape how that, how that fits into something totally new. Um, and so I think that's just sort of a limitation of, of academia. And, and personally, you know, it's, I don't have a great answer because even even being an industry, um, you know, we're we're a relatively small company at Apple. You know, we don't act exactly have the resources of some of the other big names in, in this field or on this sign over here. So, um, you know, we're we're certainly constrained as well as far as the problems we can solve. We can't really afford to run models on basically feeding, you know, 16k samples a second into a, into a neural net. You know that's just not in our budget. So um, there's certainly a, a question of like who are the biggest fish, and there's kind of a it kind of trickles down from there. Yeah, I don't really feel that qualified since I'm more from the development world than the academic world. But uh, if I could direct everybody, I think just interpretability and sort of understanding some of the math behind why certain training methods work versus others. I feel like um, that's still something that's not kind of a, there's really a deep theory around yet. And that's something that I don't think does require a lot of data to do. And I'd, I'd love to see more research into that area, especially as a working programmer, because you know something goes wrong, you have no idea what's going on, you have no idea what's supposed to be going on. It can be kind of frustrating. Yeah, for me, I, I think one of the things that I feel compelled to point out is that there's a bit of a dichotomy in the kind of people, the kind of cross-functional expertise that's required to uh, create, do a lot of innovation in AI and ML. And people generally tend to get very specialized in whatever it is that they're good at. So it could be, for example, someone's very good at math, so they're focusing a lot on a lot of math problems. This is great. And there's someone maybe very good at doing programming and they're focusing on programming problems. This is also very good. But I think something that tends to become a luxury in industry and it's, it's very hard to sort of prioritize it inside of companies is being extremely cross-functional to sort of be a renaissance man or a renaissance woman. And I think this is the kind of problems that universities should take on is to really look at problems from a very holistic perspective and one of my favorite problems that continues to be, uh, I, I don't know if I'm fully informed uh, about this, so feel free to, for, for any one of you to point out, but it seems like math itself is, uh, is a user interface at the end of the day. And it seems like we've done very little work at uh, figuring out how to uh, come up with new user interfaces for math. And it seems like this is a very fundamental problem of machine learning, is that as we're starting to, uh, 
make the data into the programming language itself, uh, to look at data sets and then say that it's learned a model and that model is an abstraction. So suddenly, you know, it, it reminds me of this quote, I don't know, it's, I, maybe it's a quote from quantum mechanics, is that the best model for a cat is another, or preferably the same cat. I don't know who made this quote, <laughs> but it seems like machine learning is suddenly going towards the same direction where the model has learned something and you have a model and you don't know what it's learned. And the only way to understand this model and interact with this AI and to get smarter, to make yourself smart enough to leverage this AI is to figure out with new interfaces that, you know, sort of, and math seems like it's still stuck on some notation that is, a, is an artifact of typefaces. And it seems like problems like this, uh, which are very cross-functional and question basic assumptions, is uh, what universities should be working on. Thanks. Are there any <coughs> other questions? Somewhere else? No. And I have one question is, okay, <clears throat> what would you do if uh, you had, I don't know, let's say five million pounds suddenly? <laughs> of course, you could not use them for your own <laughs> personal use, but you could do whatever you want in your team to focus on a problem and you, you would have like, I, I don't know. That's a very hard question. Some uh, professor here at UCL once Ask me that, and I was like, I don't know, no idea. But then I thought about it. <laughs> but so, what would you do? I mean, uh, if you had five millions and say five years, what would you focus on to make you know, a significant progress in your whatever domain where you are working on currently? That's uh, yeah, I know. I didn't uh, yeah, well, prepare that. Mm -hmm. I would focus on a lot of different projects and sort of start to see which ones kind of connect with things that musicians actually want to do, you know? Like it's, it ultimately comes down to like, what, is the, what are the creative possibilities, you know? And like, I think... So you would come back to the users, to the listeners? Absolutely. Or a, but I think it also, you know, there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done before you can do that, you know? Like cu coming up with ideas, like here's a perfect MIDI transcription, for instance, and take that to the users and say, how would you, how is this useful to you? What would you do with this, you know? Because maybe, maybe it turns out that, you know, that's not useful to anyone, I don't know. Mm. Um, it's not really for, for me to say because I'm not uh, producing music, you know, full time as my, as my job. I think ultimately that's who is using these products and that's who we want to make these products for. So what, you, what would you do? But All right. which would be AI related? Um, AI related. Of course. Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the things I'm most interested in is the parameter scheme for these professional music tools. And I've always felt that they're so hard to use because a lot of them, you know, for a compressor, say there's a threshold control, but that control does nothing on its own. It only interacts with the input audio. So how do we make the controls more about what you actually want? And I feel like their ML probably has a role there because what users want is to achieve a certain sound. They don't care what the threshold is. They don't care what the ratio is. They care you know, what the dynamic range of the output is. So how do we sort of rethink music production in those terms where you're actually going from the user's intent rather from the details of how these processors work? And I think ML probably has a you know, big part in that. So reducing the number of parameters, right? Not necessarily reducing it, but making them more uh, kind of directive based on the user's mm -hmm. intent rather than sort of details of yeah. These are how the tools used to work in you know, analog domain. You had no other choice. You, mm -hmm. you needed that threshold control, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but if you think about audio synthesis, I mean, there are mm -hmm. me many methods to synthesize audio. And in fact, none of them is, uh, makes sense for, for a non-technical uh, you know, user. I mean, it's like either additive, subtractive, FM, uh, well, granular. So this, this, it has been, I mean, it's not, it's a, it's a it's problem that actually has never been cracked. How can you mm -hmm. specify a, a user interface in which anyone can get the sound that he or she has in mind? I mean, that's a... Yeah, one of the kind of, you know, coming, uh, one of the sort of classical problems with, for instance, physical modeling has always been like, too many, having too many parameters to deal with and having it being very difficult to come up with presets. And so, I think like if people, if we were able to figure out like a better parameter scheme, I think physical modeling could really open up for instance, because essentially 
one of the problems with physical modeling is like you get to the point where there'll be one parameter and like on the slider, like there's a tiny little space and that space is like the part that's actually interesting. And there's this huge space where if you go off to one side too much, the whole thing, the whole model explodes. And so, um, and it's all related to basically the physical properties of the instrument that's being modeled. And so oftentimes there aren't, like the combinations are very um, difficult to find in ways that are interesting. And so perhaps there's a way to, to use a technique like that to basically reduce the space to the parameters that are actually interesting. Yeah, and I think maybe also it would be very interesting to use, to come up with a technique that's, uh, that uses query by humming as sort of an interface, but uh, using that to query different kinds of parameters. So it could be by humming or it could be by gesture, basically trying to index into various traits by trying to imitate them and then kind of putting that together into uh, navigating the space more efficiently and getting closer to the part of the data set that you want to explore. So maybe that's the new sort of preset explorer is uh, sort of this multimodal interaction that uh, you can use to incrementally query by not really humming, but uh, by imitation, some sort of imitation of the sound. All right, so anyone has any question, remark, comment? Criticism, query, request. <laughs> Anything to say? No? <laughs> so, yes. Uh, him. Um, a lot of these machine learning techniques are all tied to the idea that you have huge amounts of data to learn from, like you have a million songs or whatever. But let's say, as a musician, I've only made 20 songs, and uh, I still want to use something. I still want something to learn from what I've made. Do you, can you imagine anything being useful in that situation? Absolutely, I mean, I think, I think you can basically construct a generic model of like kind of generally what people are doing with music. And we've seen this in other domains already. And then basically seed it or feed it with kind of the specific thing you're looking for and sort of priming it in that direction. Um, GPT-2, for instance, is a text model, but it's basically trained on a giant corpus of um, text from, I think, Reddit posts. And then basically, if you want to have it, say, write like a newspaper article, you can feed it with a couple of new, like a bunch of newspaper articles, and it'll sort of like start to orient itself in that direction. So that might be one sort of strategy. I'm not sure if what the exact numbers involved would have to be. But um, I think once you sort of have a general model of like what music even is, like you can start to use um, smaller amounts of data to push it in one direction or another. Right, yeah, so you need all the data in the world and then you can find where you are <laughs> in that. <laughs> well, so like as an individual musician, you know, you wouldn't need to create this giant model yourself. You know, it would be sort of up to someone with all of the resources, who is able to do that first. All right, yes, there is one there. This is on the topic of what people like, uh, you know, what people enjoy, what's good, and it also relates to the skipping problem that you talked about earlier. Um, in visual art, one of the things that I like is that I can look at visual art and very quickly decide whether this is something I want to spend more time on. Uh, you know, it's just there and then I can skim through it and then say, okay, I want to look at this one. Um, walking through a museum, you might go very quickly, but then you, you find one that you really want to stay with. Whereas with music, it's because it takes time, it's much harder and so you're tempted to skip ahead and yet you might miss something that's really great. Uh, I was wondering if there's been any research in um, taking music and finding an alternate representation for it that could be serve as a thumbnail, uh, sort of, so that uh, you could use that to help decide whether you want to continue listening uh, in a way that takes less time. Yeah, there were a lot of papers on uh, music summarization at, in the Ismia community. When a guy called Geoffroy Peters did a number of things, so trying to identify, especially like repeating parts more or less, and then with this knowledge, building a condensed or smaller version. I'm not sure it actually um, says a lot about why we like or, what, or why we don't like. 
But uh, yes, there are lots of uh, practical application of uh, summarization of songs and audio in general. Um, and I'm certainly not the, the specialist of that, but uh, what I know is that at some point, I, I ask myself the question, what, what is the effect of hearing the same song twice or three times or, or 10 times, right? Do you, if you hear something many times, do you tend to like it more or hate it more or whatever? So, and I start to look at the uh, literature and, uh, and actually this problem is well known in psychology. It's called the mere exposure effect. So you are exposed to something. What happens when you are exposed more and more? And I read, I don't know how many papers. It's really hard to read because it's experimental, experimental psychology, lots of jargon, but anyway. So I can tell you the results so that you don't have to do this. <laughs> so you have one third of the papers that tell you that yes, the more you listen to, the more you like. And then you have another third of the paper which tells you exactly the, the opposite. So the more you listen, the less you like. And then the other third is like a kind of uh, U-shape. <laughs> so basically we have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and why it is so, it's because the people who do these kinds of experiments, I mean, they are serious people. I'm not saying that they are doing crap, but they, they don't listen, they don't uh, consider music because music is too complex. So they consider like tones, uh, sequences or very simple chord sequences or you know very simple simplifying kinds of musical uh, artifacts but which has which have nothing to do with music because music is very multidimensional and there are many reasons why you can like and not like and so forth so and to me that's that's that should be the starting point of all this you know what do we know about the way people actually listen to music hear sound and decide to listen more or less, or how they are influenced by the fact that they listen several times to the same thing. You know, that kind of very, very uh, basic uh, rudimentary uh, questions. And um, uh, to me, what is really incredible that the AI and machine learning is so powerful, does incredible stuff, and we still don't know anything about what it means for uh, like a human brain to listen to music. Which would be a nice conclusion for this panel, by the way, no? But unless <laughs> you, have, you have more to say. No? I think we are running out of time. So if there is no, uh, no one is complaining, we should close this. <laughs> no, someone said no? Yes. Oh, okay. All right, okay, thank you very much.